Right. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, and thank you all for finding the time to attend North's first member only webinar on soya beans. Uh, before we begin, a couple of pointers on housekeeping. Uh, can I request all participants to please ensure that microphones are muted as keeping them unmuted will cause interference with the sound quality during the webinar. Uh, please use the chat function if you wish to ask questions and we will address these during the Q&A session at the end. However, do note that we want to stick to the time slot and if we do run out of time, we will respond to those unanswered questions by creating an FAQ and sending it to you all. We are also recording this webinar to make it available to view for people who are unable to attend today, and we will also upload the recording on North's YouTube page. Uh, we've sent you the slide deck by email, so in case you are having difficulties viewing the slides here, you can always refer to that slide deck. Right, so these are the topics that we plan to uh, cover during the webinar today. So first of all, the big question, is there an issue with the carriage of soya beans? Well, obviously we believe there is, and in a few minutes we will share some statistics which will demonstrate that problems do exist. Uh, we will look at some of the most common challenges faced with soya bean shipments, their causation, both from a scientific and practical standpoint, and what can be done to reduce the likelihood of occurrence, and perhaps more importantly, what steps can be taken to protect ourselves and ensure that we have the best defense if a claim were to arise. Uh, before we go on to the main topic, uh, the panelists will briefly introduce themselves. Uh, we will begin with our expert, James Blythe, uh, who is a guru when it comes to agricultural products. James, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, Andy. James Blythe here. Um, I'm a biologist at CWA in the Food and Agricultural Commodities Department. Um, I've been working at CWA for eight years, and over that time we've had uh, a huge number of cases with North, um, and I think probably the majority of those have involved soybeans in one way or another. Hi, my name is Ben. Um, I was previously a lawyer from uh, doing shipping litigation in Singapore. I've been in the north in the Singapore office for the last nine years. Hello, uh, hello everyone. My name is Bao Hai Gao. I work in North Shanghai office dealing with PNI claims. I joined the club in 2012. Um, before that, I had practiced in a Chinese shipping law firm. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Andy Glenn. I've been with North for 14 years now based here in Singapore since January 2019. And prior to joining North, I was at sea for 16 years before going into maritime education in Scotland's Maritime College, uh, where I lectured there for seven years. Thanks, Andy. And finally, it's me. Uh, last but not the least, Andy Desai. I think I suppose over a period of my last six years with North, I may have met many of you. Uh, as Andy said, I work with him in the loss prevention department in the Singapore office. Uh, prior to coming ashore uh, to Singapore in 20, uh, 2008, I sailed on ships for 18 years. Right, so let's get started. Oh, why are these slides jumping? Sorry, give me a sec. Uh, well, this slide basically shows the main trade routes, although they are not exhaustive. Uh, approximately 335 million tons of soya bean was produced in 2019, uh, and the US and the Brazil account for more than 85% of all the global soya bean exports, moving more than 140 million tons between them last year. And China is reportedly expected to import up to 110 million tons of soya bean per annum by the year 2026, and that's a huge quantity. Um, owing to the recent tariff wars between US and China, uh, we've seen a significant increase in exports from Brazil, and we'll shortly see why that is not necessarily a good thing for vessels involved in that trade. Uh, we'll be looking at some of the properties of soya beans shortly, but for the time being, it might be worth reminding ourselves that the temperature and the moisture content of the soya bean prior to loading are the critical factors in determining how the cargo matures during storage and shipment. We must therefore be very mindful of the prevailing weather conditions at the load port at the time of shipment. 
Uh, from our experience, we see more cargo quality disputes with soya being exported from Brazil as compared to the US. James, uh, would you say that's a fair comment? Hi, Andy. Um, yeah, I think that certainly has been the case over the last few, year, few years. Um, certainly in our experience, since the US-China trade wars, um, the Chinese have switched to importing more from Brazil. So just very simply, importing more has seen a larger number of uh, claims in that respect. But in tandem with the increased quantity, uh, Brazil has been expanding their production. Um, so in the central areas, and you may have seen on the news about uh, expansion into uh, forested areas. So there's a lot more farmland um, that's now been now growing soybeans, but that it hasn't been reflected in uh, in tandem with an infrastructure development. So we get we tend to see more delays um, in the harvest uh, and in the storage. So you've got the, the impact of uh, the delays on the moisture content and leading to heating issues and quality issues before the cargo even arrives at the port. Um, and in addition to that, you've got the difference uh, in the quality standards between Brazil and China. Um, so the, the Brazilian soybeans, they're exported on their, for example, the Anac 41 contract, which has got a maximum tolerance of damaged beans of 8.5%, whereas in China, uh, grade five soybeans, for example, have got a maximum uh, total damage of 5%. So it's a combination of differences in the standards and these delays and a combination of issues at load port, which together mean we're seeing a lot more claims, um, particularly from Brazil to China with the soybeans. Well, thanks. Thanks very much, James. Uh, ben, would you like to add anything from a claims perspective uh, on this slide? Yeah, I think it's important to, to add that it's helpful to bring the charterers in uh, for, for owners to let the charterers know early on so that the char so, as, so that the owners can protect their claim of the, the recovery claims against the charterers and putting them on notice. Um, if the CP contains ICA clause, then giving the written notice will satisfy the two-year time bar under the ICA. And the charterers can't say that they didn't know that there was a claim or, or, or they didn't have the opportunity to investigate. But more importantly, the charterers can then pass the, the claim down the CP chain because very often, the party at the bottom of the CP chain is likely to be the trader. Um, and uh, it, it, would ex it would assist if the traders are involved and you know, they, they might be able to put the, put the, the people on notice. Uh, if, the, if, the, if the receivers are large international companies like the ABCDs or Kofco, they might be a bit more concerned about their international reputation. Um, also for the traders who are the charters at the bottom of the chain, the sale and purchase contracts with the shippers and with the receivers would be on phosphor or ANAC terms. Um, these contracts typically contain very short time bars. So they need to be notified early so that they can protect their own claims against whether it's the shipper or it's the receiver. Um, because if those claims are still alive, then there's a higher chance that people will contribute. Because otherwise, if it's time barred, then everyone's going to just walk away. Okay? Thanks, Ben. Um, next couple of slides just cover off some of the statistics that we've gathered from a claims experience at North over the last five years. This particular one shows uh, the distribution of grain claims by number. And we can see here that uh, damage claims account for 27% and wet damage claims for 12%. Now, you can also see here that shortage claims uh, represent 34%. Uh, but bear in mind this is by number. If we move on to the next slide, like Sandy, which um, is by cost, you'll see there's a significant, uh, significant difference. So over the same period, we can see quite a different spread with some 80% of all claims related to cargo damage, uh, including wet damage claims. This is a huge number and it equates to many millions of dollars and you know looking back over that five year period just prepping for this session i estimate we've got approximately 39 million dollars um and incurred damage claims um, sitting uh, with north at the moment and a very large proportion of these relate to the brazil china uh, soya bean trade uh, next slide please andy um 
we could easily spend hours discussing all of these individual grain cargo damage types, um, but unfortunately, we don't have time to do that today. So we're going to concentrate on the three most common and expensive types of damages associated with soybean claims um, exported from Brazil in particular. And these are heat damage uh, caused by coming into direct contact with surfaces in excess of 40 degrees Celsius. This is most often consequence from uh, storage of fuel and adjacent tanks to the hold. Um, but it could also be uh, engine room bulkheads um, or you know hold lighting being left on um, when the, the holds are battened down. Mold damage caused by a combination of, of moisture and heat, in the most part unrelated to any actions by the crew, and we'll touch on that a little bit later. Uh, and then wet damage um, caused by condensation, sweat, uh, leaky hatch covers, hold access hatches, and occasionally and sometimes at considerable cost, pure, uh, poorly secured hold ballast tank manhole covers. Uh, now I'm going to hand over to James um, and he's going to talk about the, the important sciencey bit on why we see these types of problems, um, running through some pictures showing each type of damage and giving some commentary along the way. Okay, over to you, James. Thanks, Andy. Um, so the, one of the reasons that we see, we tend to see more claims involving soybeans is that they're an oil seed. Um, so they have a much higher oil content compared to cereals such as wheat or maize. So soybeans have a inherent oil content of around 18 to 22 percent, whereas seal, uh, cereals will have an oil content around two to five percent. So this means that they're inherently more prone to self-heating uh, and heat damage itself. Um, and the reason for that is um, they can reach a lower, they can reach an equilibrium relative humidity, which causes uh, microbiological heating at a lower moisture content compared to cereals because the, uh, the oil content takes up a large proportion of the seed itself. So, in terms of heat damage, we're talk there's two separate issues really. We're talking about self heating from mold growth or from heat transfer, which is uh, this slide. So, it tends to be associated with localized heating. Um, from fuel tanks um, and the damage associated with this heat transfer tends to be uh, to the beans in direct contact with the, the tank. As you can see in this example photograph, there's a, been like a, a toasting effect of the cargo in direct contact with the tank. Um, so what we'll get in, in the beans in direct contact, there could be mold growth, um, initiated by the warmer temperatures, uh, oil breakdown, which will cause discoloration. Um, and I think the main takeaway from this slide is just that heat damage, heat tra transfer will cause heat damage to, and mild growth in the cargo in close contact, but also uh, it will lead to moisture migration away from the heat source. So you'll have moisture migration away from the cargo in contact with the tank, and that can lead to an increase in moisture elsewhere in the cargo. Uh, and that would lead to mold growth and self-heating. So very simply, you've got, you can have damage in contact with the tank and then increased quantity of damage elsewhere. Uh, next slide, please, Andy. And so this is the other type of uh, self-heating, uh, heat damage, which is self-heating. Um, and this is due to uh, the combination of the cargo temperature and the moisture content at loading. So whether the cargo is microbiologically stable depends on these two factors. Um, and as I mentioned, the equilibrium relative humidity is uh, based on the moisture content and the temperature. So the limiting uh, ERH is between 65 and 70 percent, and that's equivalent to a moisture content of around 13 percent at 25 degrees. So if you go any higher than that, you'll tend to get uh, mold growth um, in the stow, and along with that mold growth, you'll see localized increase in temperature, um, moisture migration, um, which can, as it develops, lead to oil breakdown, um, which and the oil breakdown again leads to more heating, um, and that will lead to discoloration, ex extending even to carbonization. So you can see in this photograph, 
the the range of uh, heating and discoloration. So the beans on the left in the top photo, creamy coloured, and then as it progresses through the levels of heating, you'll get a gradual darkening. And as the temperatures increase above 40 degrees, you'll switch to oil, uh, the oil breakdown and the chemical heating. And that's where we get these uh, very dark carbonized beans. Uh, next slide, please, Andy. Uh, so this is an example of uh, what can happen in the stove. It's quite an extreme example. Um, so localized high moisture content would begin to break down through uh, mold growth and heating. And then when that switches to the chemical heating, you get this very, very dark discoloration in the center there where the cargo is black. And then you've got the darkening uh, to the left where it's more brown. Um, and characteristic of self-heating within the stove is a layer of mold. As you can see, this white layer of mold under the surface. So in this example, this self-heating is very close to the surface. Um, and that can be partly due to self-heating elsewhere in the stove and the heat rising upwards um, and increasing moisture content in part of the cargo. And where the moisture is driven to the surface. Um, but what you can see there on the right is also that the cargo is is the area of discoloration is actually quite localized. So this quantity wise, this example is it may not be that significant um, and with careful segregation, uh, the damage can be minimized. Uh, next slide, please, Andy. Uh, James, on segregation, I had a question. What is the best way of segregating uh, this damaged cargo if it's just a, a top layer or something like that? You have any yeah. uh, Well, the easiest way is to do it by grab. And they, if they can dig out that, it depends. Really depends on the location within the in the hold. If you can try and discharge sound cargo around it um, and minimise the mixing, what you tend to get is you you get different grades. The, so the, there'll be some of this will mix in, um, but it's the extent of mixing. So what we always recommend is that whenever you're segregating a cargo, you also representatively sample the cargo that is segregated. So then you can test. The segregated cargo to see the extent of the damage so you've got different grades and then you can say well okay this one is the worst and then the second grade and then so on thanks james so this is just just a handful of soybeans just to show you can get them slightly mixed um, and this can be something that happens at loading um, so it's quite common for cargoes of different qualities to be mixed um, in order to achieve an overall grade for export. Um, but so some mouldy beans and some dark beans are to be expected in a in a bulk cargo. Certainly in Brazil, when they're these cargoes, you might be loading seventy thousand tons. It's it's come from a wide geographical area. It's a mixture of different sources. It might include some older cargo that's been in storage for some time. Um, so you will get a mixture um, and it, it may it won't be necessarily noticeable on loading. Um, but it's, it's quite common to see mix a mixture, a mixed quality at loading um, uh, with, uh, with dark beans and lighter beans together. And that's just an inherent uh, quality of the, the loading pro procedure. Next slide, please, Andy. Uh, this is the, the, the next section uh, is on wet damage, and this is just quite an extreme example just to highlight um, the effect of ship sweat um, condensation dripping back onto the surface. So you can see the characteristic uh, grid lines where the moisture has dripped back onto the cargo surface and the very black areas of where it's become very mouldy and the cargo is deteriorated. Um, this is essentially happening when you, you've got a warm cargo and you're sailing via a cooler, relatively cooler uh, environment, or you might be delayed for some time in a much cooler environment. So say you're loading in northern Brazil um, and you're sailing via South Africa, you may get some 
condensation ships wet as you pass South Africa. And then if you're arriving um, in northern China in winter, uh, you may have the conditions for condensation in ships wet while you're waiting. Um, the damage from ships wet tends to be quite limited, um, but can be can be extended if it's channeled down the side frames. Um, and there's two ventilation rules which we'll come on to slightly later. But in essence, you need to to make sure that you're ventilating correctly uh, to either of the rules. You need to measure the cargo temperature at loading or accurately measure the dew point in the headspace. Next slide, please, Andy. Uh, this slide was just to give an example. Again, you can see the grid lines um, related to condensation dripping back onto the cargo surface, but they removed a grab from the center. And you can see there's actually some very dark discoloration in the center of the hold, um, suggesting that the damage to the surface is not only related to ventilation, and the causation may actually be a, a more deep-rooted problem. Um, in this case, uh, probably to do with self-heating lowering, lowering the stow. So self-heating leads to the moisture migration upwards, uh, loss of moisture into the headspace above the cargo. So you've got increased moisture content and increased temperature in your hold. Um, so you've got a greater risk of condensation when the steelwork cools. Um, the only method of cargo care available is natural ventilation. Um, and unfortunately, that can't sufficiently remove the moisture released from a self-heating cargo. So this surface damage is, if you've got a self heavily self-heating cargo, is largely unavoidable. And your natural ventilation doesn't have any effect on the self-heating much deeper in the stow. Okay, next slide, please, Andy. Uh, this is another type of damage we see quite frequently. Uh, it tends to be moisture migration from the centre of the stow to the cooler peripheries. It's where you've got a warm, relatively warm cargo, again, sailing through a, a cooler or delayed during a, in a cool environment. Um, again, this, this type of damage tends to be quite limited in quantity um, to the areas that are wetted by the condensation and the moisture migration at the sides. So with careful segregation, this can be uh, bagged up and removed without contaminating a larger quantity of cargo. Um, again, this is this can be this type of damage can be related to self heating within the stove. So if you've got self heating in the center of the hole, you've got a you have a higher temperature gradient and the more moisture migration to the peripheries. Um, next slide, please, Andy. And the final one, uh, wet damage from water ingress uh, tends to be through uh, when the holds or the hatch cover seals are not sufficiently weathertight. Um, I think it's quite helpful to get take photographic evidence of this, which you've got quite clearly see in these photographs. You've got what you tend to get is where the water ingress occurs you have a localized column of moldy and caked cargo. And depending on the level of water ingress, this can, in some cases, reach almost reach to the tank top. So you tend to get, I think the worst case we had was where the column of damaged cargo went from the hatch combing all the way down to the tank top. So almost 20 meters of caked cargo. Um, but quantity wise, that's only 10 to 15 tons. Um, so with careful segregation, you can minimise the extent of damage from uh, a caked column um, just by bagging it into a jumbo bag, um, perhaps with a bigger bucket than that labourer there. Um, but the problem with these sort of issues is um, the receivers tend to discharge using a grab and this gets broken up and mixed in. So rather than a claim for 10 to 15 tonnes, you end up with a claim for a thousand tons that they've segregated because they've broken this cargo up, this damaged cargo up and mixed it in. Okay, and uh, handing back to Andy now for some, as we move on to some loss prevention topics. Yeah, thanks. Thanks very much, James. It was very informative. Um, 
Well, anyway, now that we before I before I continue, people who participants who joined in late, if they have any questions, please use the chat function uh, in Microsoft Teams, and uh, please let us know any questions that that you all have, and we'll address them. We've kept about 10-15 minutes at, after the end of the webinar to address the questions, uh, but if you have any, do use the chat function and and bring them up. Uh, Right, so now that we've looked at the science bit uh, from James, uh, the causes of the damage and what it does to the cargo, uh, not to mention the inherent vice of the cargo itself, uh, I think it's interesting to note that you can still save quite a lot of cargo if you act early to get people like James involved to help in these situations. Uh, now, unfortunately, there is no one solution to this problem, but there are certain things that we can do to prevent such claims. And in case of a claim, then help in the claims handling process. Uh, now, I think uh, originally when Andy mentioned about the types of damage that we are going to discuss today, he did mention uh, various sources. So as he said, heat can transmit into the cargo holds through fuel tanks, hole lighting, sometimes even engine room bulkheads. Uh, I think the most common uh, source of heat that we see, however, is the fuel tanks, which are usually on either side of the hold. And since the arrival of the new very low sulfur fuel oil fuels in the market at the beginning of the year, uh, I think we've seen an uptick in the problems as some of these fuels may require slightly more heating. Uh, since that time, we have been trying to spread some awareness on maintaining greater focus on fuel management on board. And I appreciate this is easier said than done, but where it is possible, try and wait for the test results of these new fuels to see how much heating would be required and perhaps then consider whether that heating will have any adverse effect on the cargo. Uh, we've also seen issues when looking at claims where uh, steam heating coils maintenance has lacked or the accuracy of temperature gauges uh, is incorrect and therefore the need to stay on top of maintenance <clears throat> and have a good planned maintenance system in place to ensure that all maintenance is done and then record it in detail. Ideally, not just a tick box exercise, uh, but a small description of the task performed, how much time was spent, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, record keeping in some claims is also noted to be very relaxed, with practically missing or no fuel temperature records. Uh, do take note that for this carriage of these cargoes, temperatures record should be maintained accurately for the entire voyage, because if there is a claim, these issues will come up. And the stronger your plan maintenance system is and the better your record keeping is, the better it is for the claims handling process. Of course, this does not mean that good plan maintenance systems and record keeping is required just for this cargo. They should be a part of the organization's culture, which will then reflect in the crew's you know, daily work, whatever cargo the vessel carries. Uh, ben, uh, would you like to add anything from a claims perspective on this particular slide to do with heat uh, prevention? Yeah, I think from a clinic's perspective, I can only emphasize what Andy said about the importance of record keeping. Um, under English law, the doctrine of billment is such that the cargo interests would have entrusted their cargo to the vessel for the carriage. And it's in the vessel's care, custody and control. So having loaded the cargo in good order and condition because a clean bill is, is issued and it's arrived damaged, they would then say that it is for the vessel to show why the vessel was not negligent. So with, with that background in mind, the cargo interest will attack any failure by the owners to show good record, uh, to, to provide good records of how they had uh, done all they needed to do, uh, why there was no fault on the part of the vessel. If either the records are missing or there are problems with it, um, they would make a, a, a mountain of a molehill for, for it. And then it becomes a lot more difficult for the owners to try to defend the claim even if it is not relevant. Okay. Cheers, Cheers Ben. Thanks very much. James, um, as an expert, would you have anything else to add on what has already been said with regards to heat prevention? Uh, yeah, I think the, one of the key things you can try and do is, is try to keep the fuel uh, temperature as low as possible, but whilst keeping it usable. Um, uh, so just maintaining the temperature as low as possible. Um, really, You've got to consider when, if you're like, is the the key thing is the temperature difference between the cargo and the the fuel. So if you it tends to be if you if you happen to be loading a cargo that's quite low temperature, um, the, the risk is that you your 
the fuel tank could heat up the cargo and then lead to moisture migration to a cooler area of cargo. So it's really considering the conditions of the cargo to be loading as well, loaded as well. Um, another thing to consider is also the stowage plan at the load port, um, just to make sure try it, that you can try and minimise cargo contact with the fuel tank. For example, if you've got fuel tanks that are top wing tanks, just try and minimise the contact um, with the tanks. Yeah, that's a great point, James. Uh, people don't often think about this, but yes, I mean, one of the easiest way to prevent this kind of heat damage is to actually not let the cargo come in touch with uh, the bunker tanks. Well, great. So uh, I think what we've discussed from the slide, the key takeaways for participants to remember are essentially keep the fuel temperatures as low as possible, uh, have a proper and comprehensive plant maintenance system, carry out all the maintenance as required by the plant maintenance system and maintain comprehensive maintenance records. Make sure the temperature of uh, the fuel is recorded on a daily basis throughout the voyage. Um, yeah, I think that's about it. Thanks, Andy. Uh, just moving on now to uh, the mold and self-heating prevention aspect of it. If you recall, the claim stats that we showed at the beginning of the presentation, you'll remember that 80% by cost were damage claims. And by some significant margin, the most costly damage claims we see arise from self-heating properties of soybean cargos, either through microbiological activity causing mold growth, uh, but also through chemical self-heating caused by the de degeneration of oil within the cargo. Now, of course, these are properties the vessel has no control over, and we must also recognise that the master is not an expert, and nor do we expect him to be. However, there are a number of things uh, the ship can do to improve the chances of success in the event of a, a claim arising. For example, asking the right questions about the condition of the cargo before loading for moisture content and cargo temperature in particular. But equally important, making a record that the questions have been asked. Uh, documents that we see often stating average moisture contents of not more than 14% are not really good enough uh, if a claim arises. So although it's most likely not available until sometime after the ship's departed, and some shippers may not even be willing to provide them in the first place, um, but it is useful if you still ask um, for the actual moisture test results, as these can often help uh, inform sort of claim mitigation strategies further down the line. Uh, a surveyor taking cargo samples and temperatures during loading can go a long way to understand how best to care for the cargo. And quite often now we see the use of moisture meters, not always 100% accurate, but will be indicative of, of the cargo condition during loading. Um, and we can't really overstress the importance of contemporaneous photo evidence uh, throughout. That can also be critical. Uh, images of uncovered trucks rolling up at the load port uh, is just one example of that. James, do you want to say a few words about the importance of sampling uh, and show how they should be taken and your thoughts on, on moisture content? Yeah, um, well, from, from sampling at loading, it's, it's not really something that's practical for the crew to do. Um, you would, if, But it's something to consider if the master thinks there is an issue, it's worth considering having the cargo represent, representatively sampled. Um, but really, it's not really practical for something for the crew to do. They can take some spot samples, but really the, the value of those um, isn't really that helpful. Um, something that the crew can actively do at loading is measure the cargo temperature um, because they may not be given an accurate moisture content at the time, but if there is a claim um, at the discharge port, eventually they will probably be given a copy of the cargo quality certificate or the cargo quality grading report, which will have the moisture content um, on, on average and the moisture content on a lot by lot basis. So together with any cargo temperatures measured by the crew at loading, we can then estimate and review whether at loading the cargo is at risk of self-heating by comparing the moisture content and the temperature. But it tends to be um, in a lot of these claims that we don't really have 
accurate temperature data from loading. So that's something that's quite straightforward that the crew could do that would be very helpful in the event of a claim at the discharge port. OK, uh, thanks for that, uh, James. I don't know, Ben, have you got something you want to add to that? Yeah, I mean, I think very often whether and how vigorously the claim is pursued at the discharge port um, often depends on the movement of the soybean price. Um, this is beyond the control of owners and owners often don't know. And perhaps this might, the, the reason for this might be that um, the, if there's a big fall in the price, uh, the receivers might have problems financing the cargo and paying for the, for the cargo and obtaining the OBL. So you end up with a long delay at the discharge port, which then prolongs the stay on board the ship. But um, the bigger the drop in the price, uh, the higher the likelihood, I think. Uh, the cargo is normally insured probably at about CIF plus 10 or 20 percent. So if the cargo is damaged, the receivers will probably claim under the insurance policy for the drop in the valuation uh, of the damaged cargo uh, basis the insured price, which is the CIF plus 10 or 20 percent. Uh, on the other hand, if the, if, if, the, if the receivers take the cargo, then they will end up losing paying for the drop in the price themselves uh, and, and on the other hand if the price has gone up during the period of the voyage um, normally unless there's very drastic damage which uh, either CI, CIQ or, or CCIC say uh, they, they prevent the, the cargo from being discharged not fit for human consumption uh, or, or it's really quite bad otherwise if it's just slight heat damage they end up taking it because I think even after adding processing costs, they end up still making money. Um, unfortunately, the, the legal system in China is, is quite difficult for owners to fully defend such claims. Uh, so perhaps Baohai can help with this part. Uh, yes, Ben. Uh, unfortunately, I'm afraid you are right about the, the Chinese court's position. Uh, well, we all understand that crew members cannot do anything effectively to, to control the soybean self-heating. Chinese courts, however, uh, prevailingly view that sufficient ventilation can prevent or reduce self-heating and always blame crew failure to ventilate for soybean self-heating damage. In the soybean self-heating case heard by Chinese Supreme Court in 2018 involving carrying vessel, the Fortune Glover, owners were found liable for about 3.2 million US dollars plus interest and costs. In that case, crew ventilated cargo holes on five days on a 45-day voyage, but did not record ambient and cargo hold temperatures and dew points in the ship ventilation log. The Chinese Supreme Court affirmed its lower cost finding that the incomplete ventilation records can prove that crew did not properly ventilate cargo and owner failed their statutory obligation to properly and carefully take care of cargo. So as you can see, it is very important for defenses in Chinese proceedings to keep a good ventilation record, which should also be supported by other ship documents. And actually, ventilation record can also be important in handling wide damage claims. And I trust that Andy will discuss in more details about how to keep a good ventilation record on next slide. Thank you. I think um, I'll just jump in there. Uh, thanks for that, Barry. I, that, that was very informative. Uh, we've had a couple of questions come in, and one of them is pertinent to this section, so I think I'll just mention that just now. And this comes from Ajit, and he's asking, would it be prudent to inform P&I if the vessel uh, is planning to load prior to loading, as the sampling by crew uh, is not often uh, accurate? And I think the answer to that, certainly from my perspective, has got to be absolutely you know, I think if you get an indication, particularly if the, the, the vessel's not carried the cargo before or the crew are unfamiliar with it, then um, if you give us some notice, then we can provide you um, to pass on to the crew all of the, the loss prevention information that we have on how this can be done more effectively, what the crew should be looking out for, what sort of evidence is important, um, and give the crew the best opportunity to to do the best job that they can. So yeah, absolutely. Um, whether it's the loss prevention contact details that you have, or whether it's your regular contact at the club, um, any of these types of cargos that carry an enhanced risk with them, 
uh, the, the more notice you give us, the more we can do to give you the information that might reduce the, the likelihood of the claim. Um, so thanks for that question, uh, Ajit. Uh, just to, uh, to finish. Andy, can I can I interject? There's one more question on the similar slide, so it's just come in now, so I might yeah, just sure, raise that. Um, this is perhaps for uh, James to answer. Uh, regarding the cargo temperatures at load port, would you recommend any standard equipment which can be used? Also, during loaded passage, ventilation based on cargo hold temperatures and outside air, do you recommend vessels to take daily temperatures of sounding pipes or use the actual temperatures recorded at the end of loading? Right, I'm going to talk about ventilation in the next slide, but however, James can perhaps address how cargo temperatures are best taken at load port. Yeah, um, so the crew, if you if the crew have access to a uh, food temperature probe, um, they can take the temperatures with that, or you can appoint a cargo surveyor um, in Brazil. And the, the surveyors tend to have calibrated digital temperature probes, um, which tend to be anywhere between 30 and 50 centimetres in length. Um, so what they do, they can take the temperature in multiple points during loading or at the end of loading, um, and then you'll get an average cargo temperature. Um, as long as it's a digital thermometer, that can measure the subsurface temperature and any, any temperature probe is acceptable as long as it's been recently calibrated. Right, thanks. Andy, back to you. Thanks, guys. Um, so just to wind up on this particular slide, then I think the key takeaway messages are the importance of evidence collection from as early as possible at the start of the voyage. And um, as best you can, knowing what the cargo temperature is, because that can inform the ventilation practice during the course of the voyage. And understanding the moisture content can give an indication of the stability of the cargo and how critical any delay might be uh, on its condition at outturn. Also, the importance of asking for actual moisture content and recording the facts that you've asked. Having a surveyor in attendance, as, as James has mentioned, uh, can help support the crew. Um, both at the load port, but also at the discharge port, uh, in order to continue that collection of contemporaneous evidence as soon as the hatch covers um, are opened. Right, uh, over to you, Andy. Thanks, thanks very much, Andy. Uh, well, the same question also spoke about ventilation, which we're going to address in these slides. So if, if your question is not addressed, then please raise another one. Uh, well, moving on to the third and last bit on loss prevention, wet damage. Uh, now, wet damage can occur due to various reasons. Okay, the most common one being leaking hatch covers. We can have things like faulty bilge non-return valves, uh, loose or improperly maintained ballast tank manholes or their gaskets, uh, corroded or hold ballast tank uh, sounding or air pipes which pass through the cargo hold. But as I said, the most common cause is usually the hatch covers, leaking hatch covers. Of course, condensation also results in in damage to the cargo, as as James spoke about uh, ship sweat and cargo sweat. So how do you avoid condensation? The short answer is ventilation. Uh, although reference is always, is always made to the dew point, uh, we in North's loss prevention department always, always recommend that you carry out ventilation in accordance with what we call as a three degree rule. Uh, ventilation can take place at any time, day or night, when the outside air temperature is at least three degrees below the cargo temperature on the thing. Uh, of course, if you choose to ventilate at night, Please be careful to ensure that the weather conditions will not lead to water ingress. The dew point rule, as someone was asking, is, is fairly complicated. It's a complicated rule. Uh, first of all, the ventilation needs to be shut off for a period of time before measuring the dew point in the cargo hold, since you want to actually measure the dew point of the air in the hold and not the ventilating air that is, you know, which is passing through the hold. Uh, if ventilation has been suspended overnight, then perhaps the ideal time to take measurements is in the morning before ventilation is resumed. However, there is a problem here. When ventilation has been suspended for so for such a long period, uh, we give rise to enclosed space fears, and therefore great entry should be great care should be taken to ensure uh, that it is very very safe for the crew to enter the hold. In comparison, the three degree rule is much easier to follow and does not require a crew member to enter the hold at any point of time. Uh, James, uh, have I missed out anything or is there anything you would like to add further on the three degree rule? Uh, I just support the, the your comments on the three degree rule. We just consider it to be much easier uh, to perform um, simply because it's just a comparison of a cargo temperature to the ambient temperature. 
Um, the difficulty with the, the dew point rule is the access to the hold, particularly as as the cargo has probably been fumigated on complete, completion of loading. So it's not really safe to enter. Um, so I think it's, it's much more straightforward to follow the three degree rule. Um, but it's on the basis of the cargo temperature at the completion of discharge, um, rather than I saw the question was asking whether uh, it should measure the cargo temperature via the sounding pipes. Um, I, you can still measure the temperature of the cargo via the sounding pipes, but I wouldn't use that to determine the ventilation. Um, that is just a simply a, a helpful record in addition to the ventilation log um, to make sure to demonstrate that you are measuring cargo temperatures um, during the voyage. Um, so I think it is helpful to measure the, the cargo temperature via the sounding pipes, but not to use that as a basis for the decision to ventilate. It's just another example that the crew were checking um, the cargo during the voyage. Yeah, I agree Thank with you, uh, James. Thanks. James and Andy, just to chip in there, I'm just keeping an eye on the questions. There's a couple that have come in um, just on the mentioning of, of fumigation. Um, and the, the challenges that can exist when you get a conflict between uh, a request or a best practice to ventilate, but you, you've got a cargo that's fumigated. I don't know, uh, James, would you want to touch on that? Andy, I think we've got a bit of ventilation bit to go through, the fumigation bit to go through. I think once we go through that, then we let it, it might be sens sensible to address these after that. What do you think? Oh, fine, that's, that's great, Andy. Carry on then. All right, okay. Um, so as I think as as, as uh, James briefly mentioned in, in one of his first slides, it, it's quite important to note with regards to ventilation that uh, self heating as such is is completely unaffected by ventilation, which means that uh, ventilation will not cause uh, nor prevent the self heating below the surface layer, uh, but ventilation can at best minimize the extent of ship sweat or condensation in only a top few centimeters of the cargo. Again, as as James mentioned, records for ventilation have to be excellent. Uh, and records must always be kept to avoid suggestions that ventilation is responsible for cargo damage. We'll, we'll go into a bit of more detail about what evidence do we need. So evidence of cargo temperature on loading, uh, the temperature when ventilation was carried out as per your three degree rule, what holes were ventilated between what times? If ventilation was not possible due to weather, then your deck logbook entries need to support this weather. Uh, arbitrary statements such as ventilation not carried out on the grounds of safety or because it was night time might not be enough. Uh, you will have to explain further, for instance, what the safety concern was or why would the crew not be able to go on deck at night, so on and so forth. Uh, upon completion of loading at load port, uh, the cargo will be usually fumigated and the master will be given specific instructions that the holes cannot be ventilated for a certain number of days for the fumigants to uh, work their magic. Uh, and these records and written instructions should be kept as well. Uh, ben, uh, do you have anything to add before I move on to the leaky hatch cover bit or if anyone else from the panel has got anything to add on to this? Um, I think in terms of the questions regarding uh, fumigation instructions and all that, uh, if it is something like two weeks, which is quite normal for Brazil, uh, normally you do, you do follow that because the it, it takes one to two weeks for the fumigants to be effective. Um, for some cargoes, especially from the US, the fumigation certificate normally says for the entire voyage. So that actually brings a different question, a different, uh, a different issue altogether, because uh, do you follow the instructions by charters to not ventilate for the entire voyage? Or do you, for safety of the cargo, to care for the cargo, uh, ventilated after two weeks or whatever it is. So I, I suggest if you do get that issue, come to us. What we will do is we will have a look at the CP as well. And what we can do is we can then try to draft messages to the charterers um, to essentially make them choose and, and, and put try to put the, the owners of the instructions back onto them so that if there is cargo damage later, at least you get you get a better shout at looking at the charters for recovery. Yeah, Ben, that's great. I think uh, that there have been three further questions on ventilation from Kenny, Ajay, and one more. I think we've addressed all of them. So the questions were at load port, cargoes are fumigated and the fumigation company restricts vessels to ventilate for two to three weeks, which goes against the vessel obligation to take care of the cargo. 
how do you safeguard owner's interest in such cases? Uh, the other one was, do we need to ventilate if holes are fumigated as usually the whole vents are sealed? And the last one on fumigation was fumigation of the cargo often stipulates that the cargo holes are sealed for a minimum period as stipulated by shippers. This often, ha this often hampers ventilation for a period. Yeah, so I think we've addressed all of these. Um, there are a couple of more questions which are on different topics, but we'll come to them after we finish this slide. Uh, otherwise, it will be a bit of an intrusion. Uh, so finally, we, we, we've spoken about ventilation and now we speak about uh, the leaky hatch covers and access hatches. Uh, for that, we usually recommend that uh, ultrasonic hatch cover testing is carried out, uh, have a robust proactive hatch cover maintenance regime in place, and this will go a long way to reduce the likelihood of water ingress and the extent of damage. And of course, records of plant maintenance and hatch weather tightness results will also help. Uh, James, would you have any final comments here before I sum up this slide? Um, just in terms of water ingress, it, it's also important to check all areas that could lead to water ingress. So we've had quite a few cases where there's been water ingress through uh, manholes or cement holes on the hatch covers as well as around the sides uh, of the hatch combing. Um, and the problem with that is that they're slightly more difficult to seg any damage beneath them is slightly more difficult to segregate um, rather than at the sides. So if you've got water ingress columns at the sides, you can discharge sound cargo from the center and slowly segregate the uh, the damage from the sides uh, beneath the hatch combing. Whereas if you've got these columns in the middle of the cargo, um, it tends to get it might get mixed in. So it's important just to not only to check the hatch combing, but um, all, all points of potential water ingress. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, I forgot about the cement holes. Thanks for reminding me, James. I mean, I've stayed on bulk carriers and yeah, the cement holes are always overlooked. Anyway, so the key takeaways, uh, I think, from, from wet damage prevention slide are basically, you know, obtain your temperature at the, at, at the cargo on loading, uh, ventilate using the three degree rule, maintain good ventilation records, uh, make sure your hatch covers have uh, been subjected to a, an ultrasonic testing regime and that it is part of your plant maintenance system. Uh, we also recommend that if any maintenance is required on the hatch covers, uh, as far as possible, repair should be carried out only in accordance with hatch cover manufacturer's instructions. Um, and of course, as, as, as we spoke about it, as finally do ensure that all other sources of water ingress, such as bilges, non-return valves, tank manholes, air and sounding pipes, and even now cement holes, uh, your ventilation uh, uh, dampers are regularly inspected and kept well maintained. Again, good record keeping of all this maintenance as per your PMS is definitely going to help uh, in case of a claim. Right. Uh, we've got a couple of other questions which were not re relevant to this topic. Ben, there is one for you. Uh, can you please advise on the notice to charterers as per the ICA if any cargo shortage claim uh, is brought against the vessel? Yep. Um, normally for cargo shortage under the ICA, it is 50-50 uh, unless you can show fault. So it's a very simple notices under the under the ICA to the charterers is very simple. It's, it's really just a written notice with as much facts as you can. Time bar under the ICA is two years, and all you need to do is to give written notification. So normally, what we do recommend is if there's ICA involved, um, give the notification early because the claim is active at that point in time. It's just a it's just a email. You, you stop the time for two years, it goes to six years, and you don't have to do that at the end, just before the two years where, where you wake up sleeping dogs again. So we, we do actually try to give it right at the start, get it over and done with, you know, take, take that off the box. Okay. Um, we can help you draft it. This it, it, is very simple. Whenever you have a problem, just, just let us know, we'll help you draft it anyway. Yeah, thank you, Ben. I hope that addresses uh, the question. Uh, there's one more. I think Andy Glenn spoke about it when he was talking about uh, the heat damage slide. But perhaps uh, James can add a bit more on this. Uh, the, the question is, actual moisture content is not known, as most of the time the shipper declaration provides oil and moisture content combined details. In such cases, how do we determine the moisture content of the cargo that is being presented for loading? I think Andy made mention to some sort of a meter, which might not be that accurate, but there are ways. James, would you like to add more onto this? Uh, yeah, lots of the survey, survey companies do actually have moisture meters. Um, so they won't necessarily give you an accurate average, which would be on the quality certificate, 
um, which would be based on representative samples, but it would give you some indication of the moisture content. So if you appoint a surveyor to take cargo temperatures, they can sometimes take moisture content readings during the loading as well. So then you have uh, a reference of temperatures and moistures during moisture, moisture content during loading, which we can review and say, well, this cargo might be at risk if you are if you are delayed significantly uh, at the before discharge. So is is having the moisture content at, and temperature at loading is helpful in in uh, assessing whether there will be a risk of problems, um, but also it would help if there is a claim, it's evidence that there was a possible problem at loading. Yeah, right. Thanks, thanks, James. Uh, there's James, one more question. Sorry, but, sorry, Andy. I just no, want to just want to expand on that a little bit. We've got a couple of minutes left, and I think there's one question uh, sitting there. Um, if if the master had concerns about the the appearance of the cargo, um, to the extent that he may anticipate something arising at outturn, could you would you go so far as to suggest that samples could be taken and lab tested or held for lab testing, um, just to have so sort of in, in preparation from a, a claim arising, or is that too far at that stage in the voyage? Uh, it depends what, what sort of problem he's noticing. Um, we have had cases where there have been barges alongside where the, the, the crew have noticed there's lumps and this lumps of mould or discoloration. Um, the problem with that is that they'll say that, oh, this is all within spec and it will get loaded. Um, but if there is an issue, it, it's certainly an option to um, pause the loading in that particular hold and then you can have a surveyor come in and take uh, samples um, with a sampling probe uh, at that point. Um, it really depends on what the issue is but yeah if, if you're part way through loading it's, it's by if you're halfway through loading it's too late to start representative sampling but you can representatively sample what is loaded after that point or you can do a, uh, a, a sampling profile across the surface of the stove that's visible at that time with the sampling probe. Okay, uh, thank you. Thanks, James. Uh, there's one other question from Ajit. Um, normal cargo holds uh, are loaded full and air circulation on the surface uh, is not free. Uh, would this, this also lead to damage to the cargo? I suppose this is a question about the limitations of, of surface ventilation. Uh, I don't know if you've got, just cover that off in a couple of minutes, James. Uh, well, if, it, if, the, if the holds are full, um, the ventilation will be um, more efficient because um, you've got smaller volume of air to exchange. Um, the, the issue we tend to have is when you've got a slack hold, um, you've got this much larger quantity of air in the airspace in the hold, so you don't really get a full exchange. Um, uh, but yeah, so it, it really comes down to making sure that you've got the right information to base your ventilation decision on. And for the three degree rule, you need a cargo temperature at loading um, and you just need the ambient temperature. So it's just making sure um, that you're ventilating to the correct rule uh, in the right way to minimize the risk of any damage. Um, because the only way that you cause damage through ventilation is if you do it incorrectly. So if you introduce warm, humid air instead of removing it, then you've got the risk of cargo sweat. And if you don't ventilate when you should ventilate, then you've got the risk of ship sweat. OK, thanks very much. Uh, over to you, Andy, just for winding up, I think. Yeah, yeah, cheers. Great discussions and great questions. Thank you all for these questions. Um, finally, a couple of couple of slides before we wind up. Uh, we have loads and loads of material, loss prevention material on, on our website. Now, some bits are free and some are not, but they're all, I mean, as long as you're a member and as long as you've registered onto the website, you will be able to benefit from all the resources that are available there. So if you've not registered, I would suggest that you please do. It does not take more than a minute. In any case, uh, if you have any questions, I mean, for this webinar or for anything else, please pick up the phone and feel free to call me or Andy here in Singapore or even alternately drop James a line uh, and he'll be happy to, uh, to assist in whatever way he can. Right, so we've had some interesting questions and if you have any more questions on this particular topic, feel, uh, please let them let us know by email. Our emails are here on the slide. Uh, and additionally, if you have any other comments or suggestions on the webinar itself, 
then do let us know that we can take them into consideration. Uh, so before we close, I'd like to say thank you to James uh, for his time and his wise words. And thank you very much to all the participants uh, who've joined in. Thank you. Thank you very much.